a few more people joining here. All right, we will go ahead and get started. Thank you everybody for joining. Um, I'm Cindy Hansen, I'm Orca Network's Education Coordinator and you'll meet the rest of the team in just a few minutes. Uh, I'm just going to talk to you for a few minutes about Zoom. Um, assuming most of you are pretty familiar with how Zoom works by now, but just in case you're not, uh, there is a chat feature. So down at the bottom bar, if you just click on chat, you can send messages to um, the panelists. You can send messages to everyone if you want to. So feel free to chat on there. Uh, if you do have any questions for the speakers, we're going to ask you to put those actually in the Q&A. So you'll see the little Q&A button, just click on that and write any questions that you have for the speakers. If you put them in chat, we just might lose them if there's a lot of chat going on and we wanna make sure we get to everybody's questions. So we will do questions after each speaker. Uh, so go ahead and feel free to write those in there as they come to you. And we will try to get to as many of those as we possibly can after each speaker. So I think that's it for Zoom. If anybody does have any technical questions or something's just not working quite right, feel free to write that in the chat uh, for us and we will try to fix that as soon as we can. So I'm going to turn it over to Susan to do our welcomes. Alrighty. Um, thank you everyone for coming in um, and joining us tonight. Thankfully, it's not a nice night for being out there on your boats <laughs> with a small craft warning and lots of wind and rain. So we're, we're happy to have you here instead. Um, and I just wanted to say this is our third um, Share the Water webinar. It's a program that Orca Network started recently to reach out in and educate and communicate with boaters. Um, we all know Puget Sound is a wonderful place to, to have a boat. We're all surrounded by water and um, it's a great, a great way to connect and um, we're, we're happy to have you with us. We want to start by just acknowledging the generations of people who came before us here in the Salish Sea um, and the Coast Salish people and their knowledge, um, generations of, of knowledge of the natural resources in the waters and the lands of the Salish Sea, um, which informs a lot of what they and what we do today to try to save the, save the water and the, the lands and the salmon and the orcas. Um, we do a lot of work with many different tribes um, I know since this is a Zoom, we have people attending from all over and um, to just remember that all of us are inhabiting lands that at one time were inhabited by coastal Salish peoples. I know here on Woodby Island where we're headquartered, um, it would be was used by several of the tribes in Northwest Washington for different seasonal um, hunting camps and longhouses and um, the canoeing. Um, so we just want to hold hold that spirit and that knowledge with us and recognize um, that their you know their way of living with the land and the water um, is one that we we feel is a a sacred connectedness to nature um, that we try to learn from and model in all that we do. So tonight we are really happy to, um, for our third webinar, the first one we were joined by Lynn Berry of NOAA Fisheries um, talking about the Be Whale Wise program. Our second webinar we had um, enforcement officers from WDFW um, partnering with us. And tonight we're really excited to have um, Margaret Palmer and Robert Reeder from the Seattle Maritime Academy and Stephanie Norman, who is a longtime um, whale nerd and naturalist <laughs> um, and boater. Um, so we really have a wealth of expertise. Um, 
And you already met Cindy Hansen, our education coordinator, and Elisa Lemire Brooks will start with um, a little catch up on what, um, what gray whales have arrived to North Puget Sound. Um, Elisa and um, her assistant Gail Swigert are amazing in tracking the numbers of gray whales, orcas, humpbacks, minkies, all the kinds of whales that come into Puget Sound um, and they document and share thousands of whale sightings every year. So we're very fortunate to have them. And um, we, we want to also invite you to share your sightings with us as, um, as you're out boating and, and get to see whales. We're always happy to hear where the whales are. So Elise, you wanna start next? Well, we had a little change of plan. So I'm actually going to do it at the end of both presentations. Oh, okay. Sorry. Kind of hang on the end of uh, Stephanie's talk about the whales. So. Okay. Yeah. Wait, I so, that. <laughs> so, so Stephanie, no. So, so now I'm totally. We're starting off with Robert. Yeah. Okay. So Robert will start. <clears throat> sorry about that. I missed the, the late breaking memo there. <laughs> so Robert, um, we turn it over to you to share all your knowledge. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Go ahead and share. All right. Um, I'm Robert Reeder. I teach at Seattle Maritime Academy, which is part of the Seattle Colleges, along with Margaret Pomert. Um, and I teach specifically navigation and uh, collision avoidance and uh, boat legal things as far as uh, boat driving generally. So uh, that's going to be my part of it tonight are specifically the regulations, um, some of which are, are, I guess, kind of obvious and some of which are not as obvious that uh, relate very directly to our interactions with the whales on the water here in the Salish Sea. There we go. Uh, so, nope. So the first place I want to start is uh, the, with the uh, navigation rules and regulations uh, specifically, and these are uh, generally thought of as being uh, preventing collisions between vessels. Um, however, uh, even the Marine Mammal Protection Act cites uh, the rules that are in here that we're going to be talking about uh, this evening. And this is a, a compilation of, uh, for those who are familiar with the codes of re regulation, this is all in 33 CFR, uh, 33 CFR 82 and 83. Um, and uh, they do very specifically relate to our protocols on the water and uh, for not just interacting with the whales, but also interacting with other vessels. And so I want to touch on a couple points that show up there that don't show up in other places that I think are very important. And then we'll get into even more whale specific things um, after. We will be talking about US federal uh, rules and regulations. We'll also be talking about Canadian rules and regulations and also the state of Washington. They are similar, but they are not all identical. So we're going to be talking about all of those. Um, so, and for those who are doing boating here in the, under the, uh, under the uh, navigation rules and regulations, all of Salish Sea falls under the, there are the international rules and the inland rules and all just for reference, all of the Salish Sea fall under the international rules, but all of these are same for international, international or inland. Um, so um, some very quick general definitions. Uh, the word vessel includes every description of watercraft used or capable of being used as a means of transportation on the water. So this includes everything from kayaks and paddle boards and kite surfers and personal watercraft uh, all the way up to container ships and super tankers and anything else like that. Um, there is no distinction in any of the rules or regulations between uh, commercial and recreational vessels. 
ever. Uh, nobody cares if you're getting paid or if you're having fun um, when you're out there interacting with other vessels or with wildlife. This is, I think, the most important of all of this. Uh, rule number five is uh, the lookout. Um, every vessel shall at all times maintain a proper lookout by sight and hearing, as well as by all available means appropriate in the prevailing circumstances and conditions so as to make full appraisal of the situation and the risk of collision. And again, whether that's the risk of collision with a vessel or an animal or some other thing, um, this is for everybody. This is for every vessel on the water. And I would say that I, my observation is that many, if not all, of the uh, collisions that have happened between vessels and marine mammals have been in, in some way largely related to a lack of a proper lookout on the vessel. And a proper lookout does not mean just sitting in the cockpit and and looking around occasionally. You do need 360 degrees of visibility, um, which may require more than one lookout. Um, in the case of the illustration, the head sail obscures the visibility of the from the cockpit. And so they have a lookout forward where they can see around the head sail, or if you have a spinnaker up, or just a, even a high riding bow for a, a hydroplaning power boat, for example. Um, and again, this is there is no difference between commercial vessels and recreational vessels as far as these rules are concerned. Uh, safe speed. Every vessel shall at all times proceed at a safe speed so that she can take proper and effective action to avoid collision and be stopped within a distance appropriate to the prevailing circumstances and conditions. Um, the fairly fairly self-explanatory, but uh, nonetheless, uh, excessive speed is a very serious problem. Again, not just with collisions between vessels, but also collisions between vessels and wildlife. Um, so, as as one of Margaret's and my old teachers would say, "Slow is pro." So beginning with the NOAA federal guidelines, uh, when, when watching whales by boat, this is for you, for, these are US guidelines. Uh, when watching whales by boat, remain at least 100 yards from all whales, um, whether they are baleen or delphinidae, but, but, but 100 yards from all whales generally. Keep 200 yards away from killer whales in Washington state inland waters. Uh, note that it does not uh, differentiate between the southern resident killer whales and the big killer whales. Um, we will see more differenti differentiation in that later. Uh, limit the amount of time spent observing individuals in groups of whales to 30 minutes or less. Do not chase, encircle, or leapfrog whales with any watercraft. Um, do not trap whales between the watercraft or the shore. I, I think they mean between, between two watercraft. Um, in some cases, uh, some of the benthic feeders, we, you actually want to let them be along the shoreline um, and to not impede them from the shoreline. Um, that's not very well worded. Uh, when encountering whales, slow down, operate at no weak speed, put your engine in neutral when whales approach to pass, and avoid approaching whales when calves are present, and never put your watercraft between a mother and its calf. Um, Commonsensical, but we've seen it happen. Uh, whale laws in Canada. So the Canadians have a have a 400 meter boundary. Keep 400 meters away when you see any killer whales. Uh, it's the law, in which they say around four football fields, 400 meters, 400 yards. Uh, essentially the same for our purposes. Uh, again, they do not uh, differentiate between the southern resident killer whales and the bigs killer whales, just 400 meters generally. Avoid whale sanctuaries. This is on the Canadian side, again. Uh, no fishing or boating around Swiftshire Bank, east coast of Saturna Island and the southwest of North Pender Island. It's the law. And the, the little graphic 
shows there's just the little red splotches. There's the little red splotch at Swiftsure, and then there's the little red splotch that's east on the east side of Saturna, and the little red splotch on the southwest of North Pender. Um, there are whale sanctuaries, and and vessels are not supposed to be there either, uh, recreational or commercial. Again, this is under the Canadian regulations. Slow to seven knots and avoid fishing. Uh, reduce your speed to less than seven knots and avoid fishing when you're within 1,000 meters of a killer whale. All of which makes good sense. Reducing vessel noise. Uh, turn off the echo sounders when not in use and engines to neutral idle when within approach distance of a killer whale. Our our echo our our echo sounders our pathometers uh, are very high pitch, and especially for the Delphinidae, it kind of goes into their range of hearing. In most cases, uh, the Salish Sea is very deep and wide. In most cases, there are very there are very few places where your navigation is going to be severely impacted. Uh, during daylight hours, especially by uh, turning off your fathometer and putting it into standby for the time that you're in proximity of the whales. Obviously, if you are in a situation where you're where you are at risk of grounding, you probably want to keep your echo your echo sounder on. But in but most of Puget Sound, most of Salish Sea, is pretty deep water, so being able to turn that off in when the in proximity to whales is just courteous and a good idea. The revised code of Washington is the, are the rules and regulations for and laws for Washington state boating, not just boating, but uh, this where part of it comes from. Uh, RCW 77.15.740 is protection of southern resident orca whales. Um, this is somewhat synopsized. If you are familiar with the RCWs, you, you know that they are written very convoluted. This is as this is and even as much of a wall of text as this is, it's better than it could be. Um, but uh, this summarizes. Uh, it is unlawful for a person to cause a vessel or other object to approach in any manner within 300 yards of a southern resident orca whale. So, whereas in Canada, it was 400 meters for all, all orca whales. In Washington state, it's 300 yards of the SRKWs. Position a vessel to be in the path of a southern resident orca whale at any point located within 400 yards of the whale. This includes intercepting a southern resident orca whale by positioning a vessel so that the prevailing wind or water current carries the vessel into the path of the whale at any point located within 400 yards of the whale. Um, so this is specifically the, the uh, NOAA regulations, uh, the NOAA recommendations talked about leap, not leapfrogging. And that's what this is saying. It's like, if you see the direction that the whales are moving, don't stick yourself in front of them so that they come, you know, they they have to divert in order to avoid coming to you. Uh, continuing with the RCW, uh, it is unlawful to position a vessel behind a southern resident orca whale at any point located within 400 yards. So 400 yards in front, 400 yards behind. It's also unlawful to fail to disengage the transmission of a vessel that is within 300 yards of a southern resident orca whale. So you don't need to shut down your motor, but you do need to uh, put your put your motor in neutral. If you have a reason why you need to keep your motor running, you can do that. But you need to be in neutral once uh, there are orcas, there are SRKWs within 300 yards. It is also unlawful for a person to cause a vessel or other object to exceed speed greater than seven knots over seven, seven knots over ground at any point located within one half nautical mile. 
um, which is uh, 1,013 yards of a southern resident orca whale, or to feed a southern resident orca whale. I don't know if anyone is out there throwing salmon at the orcas, but don't do that. Now, I want to note that there are, and having gone through the RCW, there are many, many, many exceptions to these. There are more exceptions than there are the text of the RCW, um, especially for military and commercial vessels, including commercial whale watching vessels. Um, where you are, if you are navigating within, if you, if you are navigating within a, the with the vessel uh, traffic system, if you're within a, a uh, VTS system or the within the traffic lanes, it's it's different. There are, are many the fishing vessels have different exceptions. There are many many exceptions to this. Um, if you're for your specific vessel, specific regulations and circumstance, uh, you really want to consult RCW fifteen seven forty because that's it's just the way the RCWs are written. There, it's got lots and lots and lots of exceptions to everything that we just said. So as a synopsis, and this is from Orca Network, stay 300, 400 yards from endangered southern resident orcas. Stay 200 yards from the big transient orcas. These are the, uh, the mammal-eating orcas that are here in Puget Sound and elsewhere. Stay 100 yards from baleen whales and all other marine mammals. Act respectfully, respectfully and responsibly when operating any type of vessel or watercraft which includes kayak, kayaks and paddle boards around whales and all marine mammals. Slow to under seven knots at any sign, of, at the first sign of any whale. And the rest of it is COVID stuff, <laughs> which is important, but not quite as relevant. So all of this stuff talking about uh, how many hundreds of yards or how many hundreds of meters off of the whales, I, I want to, acknowledge and address that estimating distance over water is extremely challenging. Um, as someone who has been professionally on the water for many, many years, and I train lookouts, I train ABs and mates and masters how to, how to judge distances on the water, it's hard. If you are used to seeing distances on land where you have objects on land to help make those estimates, it is surprisingly difficult to translate that into what you're seeing on water, even if you're standing on a beach or maybe even especially if you're standing on a beach and looking out over the water, but also from your own boat. Um, and it is something that just comes with practice, practice, practice. My recommendation on this is if you if your boat has a has a working radar, and many of them do, um, not every not everybody has a radar, but if you have radar on your boat, um, I find it is very, very useful to practice use your radar with things that are not, that are charted on the water or that you can see that are big that give a good radar return that you can get the range to that object in this case using a buoy. And just get a good get a sense of visually what it was like. If this thing is two tenths of a mile, then then what does two tenths of a mile look like on the water? Um, and you can do the same thing with GPS if you have a chart if you have a chart plotter, and you and something is is charted and you're going by it. You can do the same thing, and getting that visual visual estimate of okay, this is this is what this is what 400 yards looks like on the water from the cockpit of my boat. And it's going to be different from a small boat and you know the, the cockpit of a small sailboat versus the wheelhouse of a passenger ferry or the bridge of a container ship. They're going to look different just because of your elevation and your distance from the bow and all of those things. And if you're shore side looking out to the water, it's going to be similarly different. So um, if you have the means to uh, to practice with objects that are known objects on the water. Uh, where Stephanie and I live, we have a buoy that marks the center of the traffic separation scheme, and that's a very good 
uh, visually from from our house, and that's a very good estimate of okay, that's that many yards out, and so I'm seeing something that is half of that distance, and so that's how far away this thing is I'm seeing. Um, so I really recommend practicing with that and training with it because it helps. And mostly, don't forget to have fun. <laughs> you know, be safe. Be safe on the water. Maintain your proper lookout. That's really the very most important thing. Maintain a proper lookout and enjoy your time on the water and enjoy and enjoy the whales. They're wonderful. And, you know, it is the season for that. Just be safe about it and respectful. Okay. Uh, and I guess Q, it's time for the Q&A slide, which is not ours. Okay, it looks yeah. like we have one question for you, Robert, if you could, um, well, good talk, some feedback there. Thanks. And this is from Mariana. Uh, I have a question. Why is the difference in staying at different distances, distances between the different killer whale ecotypes? Is it related with their feeding behavior? I have no idea. I can I can speak to that. Stephanie can address that. I have no idea. The, the southern resident killer whales are a critically endangered population. Uh, I I don't know the the number right off the top of my head, but it's between 70 and 80 whales total in that whole population. That is a unique um, a unique genetic genetic population. They don't breed outside, so the extra offset is to give them more space for feeding, um, more space for foraging, uh, and to reduce the amount of noise that they receive underwater, so that they're not um, that that doesn't interfere with their communication. All right. Uh, does anybody else have any questions for Robert? Let's see. Uh, Stephanie Palmquist asks, uh, new to this community of whales, loving people, how can I visually tell the difference between the two types of orcas? I really think these are questions for our, our next speaker. <laughs> these are exactly questions for our next speaker. Uh, yeah, question. Stephanie well, will be going over baleen whales. Any one of us is happy to help you with that, or Stephanie, if she wants to take that, yeah. Yeah, I, I can take that quickly. Let's go see. ahead and-, and We're going to switch, switch chairs here. It looks like the questions are going to be for her. We're sharing, uh, we're sharing our technology here, so. Um, there is one more for Robert. Is he nearby? Yeah, yes, no, I'm, I'm right here. right here. Okay. I'm right here. Uh, do you have, since you're, uh, do you have any tips if a whale pops up near a paddle border? Uh, really, I mean, a paddle board is just a boat, right? So all the same things don't, you, you know, do your best to be respectful of their space. And obviously they are, you know, a, 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 any of these whales are going to be faster than your paddle board. So they're going to kind of go where they want to go. Um, but don't behave unpredictably to the whales. So if you're so, I mean, if you're paddle boarding, you're under seven knots anyway, um, unless you're a lot better at it than I am. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say maintain what you're doing, you know, and, and if you want to just stop and get your GoPro and take pictures, of course, do that. Um, I will say that the experience of, of a baleen whale, especially a humpback whale, next to a paddle board or a kayak is, um, you're not going to be thinking that much about the rules. <laughs> um, because they are enormous and it is not apparent how enormous they are until you're in the situation of being in a very small boat and you're looking up at a fluke that you are not expecting. That's the other thing that I, I want to say really quickly about the, the, with the minkies, minkies and the humpbacks especially is they will pop up where you're not expecting them. So that this is why maintaining that proper lookout is so very important because they can just pop up out of nowhere and they do. Thank you. Uh, Francis is encouraging everyone to stop at bewhalewise.org. And I think that Stephanie was likely going to cover that. We definitely will be talking about bewhalewise.org. Yes. Thank you all. Thanks, Francis. And I just wanted to thank Robert for, you know, discussing the, the perception of distance over water issue, because that's one um, we get a lot of 
whale reporters who are on land. And, and I know we have you know, been on one side of Admiralty Inlet watching whales and someone reporting from the other side and will think the whales are over there on the other side and they'll think they are close to the Whidbey side. And um, I know just watching the ships go by and looking on ship traffic, marine traffic and looking at what it looks like from our window on land, um, you know, it's a huge, you know, it's just very um, deceptive and a lot of people don't understand that. So that's a point we're really trying to educate both boaters and land-based whale watchers about. So appreciate you covering that. Yeah, we, you know, so we're, we're, we see the same thing here where we, we see, we're, we're south of Alki Point and we'll see orcas that is like, oh, they're over by Vashon. And people on Vashon are like, oh, they're over by Alki. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's very, it really is very hard. I've, you know, I've been doing, I've been, being a lookout and training lookouts for 30 years and judging distance over water is just very, very difficult for even for the professionals. A couple more for Robert here. Stephanie also would like to know, can you give an example of distance? I, you know, I, how many yards in a neighborhood block, like some other reference that we might be more familiar with on our day to day? Well, a hundred yards is a football field. Is yeah. that an American football field, 100 meters is a, is a Canadian football field um, or soccer or whatever they call that thing. Um, so it, I guess, I guess 400 meters, 400 meters would be about a city block maybe. City blocks in Seattle are weird, but they're not, they're not uniform like in some other places, but I'd say maybe a city block. Yeah, thanks. I did like your answer too about practicing. I know that I've done that with like uh, distances just in whale watching, you know, watching them from shore and uh, a lot of things ahead of time. Practicing is really useful in these situations for sure. Okay, another one. And I think it's probably gonna be similar to the paddle border about, uh, you know, so Ri Richard says when we, we've we stopped on the water at the required distance from a baleen whale and all of a sudden the whale pops up right beside you, what does one do? Appreciate it. <laughs> Take lots Appreciate of Appreciate the fact that that happens. They're, you know, they're, they are, they are very intelligent animals and they are going to, they are going to do what they are going to do. Um, they, they, they're, you're going to some, you know, you're going to have whales pop up, especially, and I, again, I want to say that especially the humpbacks are going to pop up or they're going to pop up. And, you know, and if you're a, a, if you're a kayak or a paddleboard or a rowboat where you're not going very fast in the first place, um, the best you can do is, you know, hang on and be impressed by it, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, but the the bigger issue is like faster vessels like needing need to know need to know what their what their stopping distance is what their stopping speeds are and be ready have your proper lookout and be ready to pull, yank back on the throttles right now when you when suddenly you've got a got a humpback or a minky sounding right in front of you because they sure will and I, I think I would add to you, because I know it comes up a lot when people, when we're, you know, working with the public is to not engage your motor if a boat is near you. Like a, absolutely wait until the whale moves on before you move on. Um, Giles is here. Hello, Giles. There are decently accurate laser range distance finders available in golf shops or online. Thank you for that hot tip. <laughs> And also, some binoculars have very good rangefinders built into them now too. Oh, good. Okay. You, you you can you you can get you can get rangefinders that are pretty accurate, um, and that's another way to start training your eyes to be able to make make those uh, distances as well. Excellent. Thanks. All right. Looks like all for Robert. Uh, Stephanie, do you want to take on the difference between the orca types now or? Uh, there's actually there's a spot in the um, in the presentation that I'm doing that I can work that in. 
Okay, so, great. Uh, I will I will adjust a little bit there and, and include it there. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Sure. All right. All right, everyone. Now we have Stephanie who's gonna talk to us about baleen whales and add in some orca details here. All right. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. I am uh, very happy to be here with you today doing something I was just remembering this morning. The first time I ever taught anybody about whales, which was in third grade. Um, so I guess some things never change. Uh, <laughs> and here we are again. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, first reporting various things that uh, you might want to report as a as a boater, uh, as sightings of whales, entangle entanglements or strandings, and violations of uh, various regulations, how to report those and where to report those to. Then we're going to do a quick introduction to baleen whales. What are they and what makes them baleen whales? And then who shows up here in Puget Sound? Um, and we're going to wrap up with a update about the Sounders gray whale population. If you don't know who they are, you will by the time we're done today and have more time for question and answer. So why do we want to report whale sightings? Uh, you're just out there on your boat having a nice afternoon and you weren't really thinking about it. And then, hey, there's a whale that you can see in the distance. Uh, why should you take the time to report something like that? Well, for one thing, it supports research. There are a lot of people out there who really wanna know which marine mammals are where and when and what they're doing. And um, a lot of the organizations that do this research have very limited budgets and resources, especially the ones that actually have a boat to go out on the water. They can't just cover all the, all of the water. So the more folks we have out there doing citizen science and um, making these reports, letting people know, letting these uh, organizations know what they're seeing, the better, the better picture we get of what's really happening in terms of marine mammal populations here in the Salish Sea. And that also, uh, that, that information is available to researchers. It's also information that's used to inform policymaking. So we know if there are uh, particular populations that need extra support or um, regulations that need to be changed as far as how the water is being used um, commercially or recreationally. It can also help prevent ship strikes, especially if you make a report to Orca Network and it goes up, like if you go on Facebook and, and report a sighting and then that gets shared out, there are people who are watching that and uh, you might be letting a ferry captain know or uh, another commercial vessel know that there are whales in the area so that they can keep their eyes open and, and be sure that they avoid, avoid them. So it does help with that. Other boaters on the water as well, non-commercial boaters certainly are gonna be seeing this as well. And finally, if you are reporting on a regular basis, this helps you to learn what to look for and it improves your ability, your skill as a lookout. Um, and it also helps you to develop more of an appreciation for what these animals are doing, what they need, um, where they're going to be. And you know, you're out there enjoying the water and they're here because there's something here that, that they're, um, I don't wanna to anthropomorphize too much, but enjoying you know, something that they need that they're finding here. Um, and this will help you to learn more about that. So where do you report sightings to? Well, Orca Network, of course, is one obvious one, 866-ORCA-NET, uh, or uh, go to the website. You can send an email. You can post on Facebook. Uh, and those sightings are available on Facebook um, as well, and uh, or as well as in a digest form. So if you sign up for the email digest, you'll get a, a, a um, bunch of the reports on a regular basis to let you know what's going on out there. The Whale Museum in Friday Harbor has a hotline for both the United States and Canadian waters, and that number is there on the screen. And then in British Columbia, there's also the Cetacean Sightings Network uh, with quite a memorable phone number, 866-ISAW-1. <laughs> That's where you can report your sightings to. What should you include when you are making a report? Well, there's a long list of things that we'd love to have you include in a report. Um, so get as much of this information as you can. What kind of whale is it? If you don't know, you could say it's a big whale with no dorsal fin or, you know, it's a whale with a small dorsal fin. 
that kind of information is fine if you don't know the exact species. How many animals are traveling? This can be tricky because especially if it's a group of, of killer whales, they don't all surface at the same time and you kind of have to estimate uh, how many are there. That's okay, an estimate's fine. Where did you see them? GPS coordinate, coordinates are an ideal thing to report, but if you don't have that information, you can say, you know, oh, I was standing at the point, at point, no point, and I saw whales from there. Or, you know, I was on my boat in Hood Canal by Hood's Port and there was a whale there. So any information that you can give about where that sighting happened. What direction were the animals traveling in, if that's clear? What time and what was the date of the sighting? What was the behavior? And if the animals are feeding, what are they feeding on? If you're seeing killer whales, was an adult male present? And you can tell that because they have a much taller fin than uh, the females and juveniles. If you see a group of killer whales where there's an adult male present, you will clearly be able to see the difference between his fin and the fins of all his companions. Are there any unusual marks or scars on the whales? Because sometimes those are useful for identifying who those individual whales are. And if you have any photos that can help to identify individuals, um, you can include those with a report as well. Um, when you're taking pictures of killer whales, you want to try to get the dorsal fin and the saddle patch. That's the, the light colored patch behind the dorsal fin. For gray whales and humpback whales, uh, the tail flukes are the best thing to get a picture of because that's how we identify those whales. Of course, you only want to be able to, you only want to do this if you have a camera with a good lens and you can get that photo with enough detail from an appropriate distance. Now, even if you can't get all of this information, and honestly, most people, you know, if they're not out there with the intention of I'm going to find a whale and report it, you know, it's going to be hard to get all this information. So go ahead and report even if you don't have all this information. Just knowing that there was a big whale at this place uh, can help, especially as other people are reporting and other people have more information and we can kind of put a picture together of what's going on. So that's reporting sightings. Now, if you notice that there's something wrong, there's an entanglement, the whale seems to be dragging some fishing gear or, or a, a net float or something like that, or if you come upon a stranded marine mammal, that's a different kind of reporting. The first thing you need to know is that you should not attempt to assist a stranded or entangled marine mammal under any circumstances. Uh, despite the YouTube videos that get shared around of humpbacks leaping in joy after some random person has gone out with their knife and cut a net off of it. You know, that's a really risky thing both for you and for the animal involved. An animal that's in distress is going to behave unpredictably. And it is also illegal to, um, if you are not trained and properly permitted to assist an animal that is stranded or entangled, a marine mammal who's stranded, stranded or entangled in the United States. So don't try to help it yourself. I know that can be hard when you see an animal that obviously needs some help. The thing that you need to do is report it as soon as possible. So if it's an entangled whale, there's a phone number there for uh, the West Coast in, uh, large whale entanglement um, reporting. And you can also, if you're out on your boat, US Coast Guard VHF channel 16 can be used to report an entangled whale. If it's a stranded marine mammal, whether it's dead or alive, in Central Puget Sound, that's another ORCA network uh, report. And anywhere else in Puget Sound, Washington, or Oregon, uh, there's NOAA has a stranding network. Uh, that phone number that you see there will refer to the appropriate organization who is tasked with that local region's uh, response. If you're able to get photos and video from an appropriate distance and provide that to NOAA Fisheries in any case of an entanglement or a stranding, because that's helpful information. They are not always going to be able to respond to even a live stranding or a live entanglement. Um, it really depends on resources and, and location and, and a lot of different factors. But any documentation that you can get again, goes back to uh, research and, and that helps with a lot of different things. I know, for example, that some of this research is now being used to um, redesign fishing gear uh, in coastal areas with the specific intent of making it less likely to entangle gray whales while they're on their migration. So even if it's, uh, you know, if the individual situation that you encounter 
winds up with a bad outcome for the animal involved, um, if you can document information and send it in, that's still helpful to other animals. And finally, reporting violations. If you see a, a violation of the Marine Mammal Protection Act or the Washington or uh, Canadian regulations when you're in those appropriate bodies of water, here are the numbers to call. A U.S. Waters, you're calling NOAA Law Enforcement, and Canadian Waters, you're calling the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Law Enforcement hotlines. Uh, you can also go to bewhalewise.org. In addition to having lots of information about the regulations, too, um, there is a, a reporting form there that has a lot of great detail for you to um, report what it is that, uh, that you've witnessed. And if you don't, if you're not using that form, what should you include? Uh, time, date, and location of what you've seen, what it is that's happening, a description of the vessel with the name and especially with the registration numbers if possible. If it's a big, you know, if you see a big commercial vessel with an obvious name on it, that's, you don't need to worry so much about a registration number. But if it's a small um, personal recreational vehicle, those registration numbers are really the only way that uh, enforcement has of tracking down a vessel afterwards, after the fact, and getting in touch with the people who, um, who were driving it. If you're able to get photos or video of the incident, that's really, really helpful. Otherwise, it's just basically hearsay. And then your own contact information should be included with any report as well. I'm not sure how the rules work on the Canada side of the border, but here in the United States, NOAA is required to follow up on any report. So if you have, if you provide your contact information, uh, they can get in touch with you and ask any clarifying questions um, if, they, if they need to as part of their investigation. So again, if you don't have all the information, go ahead and make the report, but do be mindful of enforcement resources. Um, it's upsetting when we see a boat that goes buzzing past a group of whales closer and like they don't even, you know, they don't even seem to care or seem to be have any awareness that the whales are there. But if you are at a distance where you can't get a registration number, um, you know, if you just call and say, I saw a boat here that did this, they still have to try to follow up on it and they can't. There's really nothing that they can do with that. So that's taking information, that's taking resources away from uh, maybe a more egregious violation. And I can say as someone who has witnessed a boat strike of a whale um, and got the registration number and, and uh, reported it, they take it very seriously. And I've been told by enforcement officers before, if you have a picture, you know, email it to them um, or, you know, call them to get the email address, send it in, even if they can't issue a citation based on a photograph, they can still get in touch with the registered owner of a vessel and let them know uh, you shouldn't have done this. This is what was wrong. And it also lets other boaters know um, that people are watching, uh, that there are eyes on them and that they need to be aware that, you know, their behavior is, is being watched. If they won't do it for the whales, maybe they'll do it because they don't want to get in trouble. So that's how to report various things that you might see. And now we're going to spend just a little bit of time talking about the whales themselves. So what is it that makes a baleen whale a baleen whale? It really has to do with how they feed. So unlike the toothed whales, like the killer whales that we're so familiar with, the baleen whales feed by straining small fish and other small creatures like krill out of the water using these plates of keratin that grow from the roof of their mouths called baleen. So keratin is the same material as your hair and fingernails. And if you can imagine, you know, a really big, thick, kind of gross, thick, grossly thick fingernail, that's what baleen is like. Um, and it, it, these, you can see on the, the top right of the slide there, that is a humpback whale. You can see the plates of baleen growing in its mouth, and then that lower picture is a gray whale. Uh, the diagram on the left sort of explains how this works. So particularly with the rorquals like humpbacks, uh, minke whales, blue whales, and fin whales, they have grooves under their throat that work like accordion pleats. The whale will look for a school of forage fish like herring or smelt, or maybe a school of krill or, or something like that. And they'll open their mouths, these pleats will expand and their mouth can take in this huge amount of water basically surrounding the school of fish or cutting through the school of fish, depending on how big it is. 
they close their mouths and then they push their tongues against the baleen and the water gets pushed out while the uh, the fish or whatever other snacks the whale found are stuck in the in the baleen and they can swallow a mouthful of food without swallowing all the seawater. This is a close up picture of some baleen and you can see how those um, those plates grow right alongside each other and that frayed edge. So that frayed edge is also on the other side of the baleen as well. And that's what forms the screen that creates this um, fine enough mesh that all these little animals can get stuck in it. And these really large animals eat very small things because they can catch them using the baleen. So when we think about boating in areas where baleen whales are, things that we need to consider are the fact that they are generally larger, much larger than killer whales and also slower than killer whales or porpoises, uh, with a possible exemption of minke whales who can travel very quickly, but we'll talk about them in a moment. Baleen whales typically have a small dorsal fin, or in the case of the gray whale, there's no dorsal fin at all. So unlike the killer whales that have this really big fin that's easy to spot from a long distance, uh, these whales do not have that, and it makes it harder to spot them. They're more likely to travel alone than killer whales. They don't have the same kind of social structure where they're traveling. Killer whales travel with their families. Baleen whales typically do not. When they come up to the surface, they are just coming up to get that blowhole out of the water so they can take a breath. And then again, if they don't have a dorsal fin or they just have a tiny dorsal fin, they've got a very low profile in the water and that can make them hard to spot if you're on a boat and you're not watching carefully. They are unpredictable and they can surface anywhere at any time. So when you're watching for them, what you want to watch for are blows when they when they breathe and there's a big column of con condensed uh, vapor. Um, and sometimes when they are making a deeper dive, they, it's, it's not uncommon for baleen whales to come up to the surface a few times, take a few breaths and then take a deeper dive. And when they make that deeper dive, they will sometimes lift their tail flukes up in the air. Um, so if you're watching for blows and flukes, that's one way to spot them, but you won't always see them. Uh, again, with minke whales, you frequently do not see their breath when they come to the surface, and minkies are not likely to, to fluke or show their flukes during a dive. So these are things to, that you can use. These are some tricks you can use, but they're not foolproof. So in Puget Sound, uh, we have several different species that we typically see. Uh, the killer whales, we have uh, killer whales, orcas, blackfish are all common names for these animals. And we have the transient or bigs killer whales, those are the mammal eaters, and the resident salmon eater killer, salmon eater killer whales known as the southern resident. Um, so to answer that earlier question about how do you tell the two apart, the short answer is on the water, always assume that you're looking at a southern resident killer whale because the regulations are stricter for them. And if you don't have a really good set of binoculars or a really good telephoto lens, it's going to be really hard for you to tell from an appropriate distance whether you're looking at residents or transients if you don't have a lot of experience with, um, with telling those animals apart. Uh, the easiest way to tell them apart, assuming that you have those good uh, optical enhancements, is that that patch behind the dorsal fin, known as the saddle patch, on a transient killer whale, they will always be solid. They're, they're going to be a solid white, solid gray. On a resident killer whale, sometimes they will have a, um, a less regular pattern. I've heard it described sometimes as like a Nike swoosh, where they, they have sort of an open swirl or, or some um, irregularity so that it's not that even white or gray patch. And that's one of the easiest ways to tell. Uh, the, the tips of their dorsal fins will also look a little bit different. The southern residents have a more rounded dorsal fin and the uh, transients tend to have a sharper looking dorsal fin. The other thing is their behavior. Uh, when you see the transient killer whales feeding, um, if you see things being, flown, being flung in the air, um, like seals or porpoises, those would be transients feeding. Uh, the the uh, residents don't typically throw their salmon through the air quite that, that dramatically. Um, and that's a really simple, brief explanation of, of how you tell the two of them apart. Again, if you're on the water, you always want to assume that they're the endangered southern residents and that you are maintaining that level of distance um, until you're absolutely 100% sure otherwise. The other whales we get here are the gray whales, humpback whales, 
and minke whales. These three are baleen whale species, and they are regularly in Puget Sound at different times of year. Um, rare, but we do we have also seen fin whales, brutus whales, and sperm whales. And I have come to learn that we never say, oh no, that whale doesn't occur here because again, they're wild animals and they show up where they wanna be, when they wanna be. I heard a report about a gray whale in the Mediterranean earlier this year, even though gray whales in the Atlantic have been extinct for a very long time. Uh, so you just never know. Um, they're, they are wild animals and they do what they wanna do. So let's talk for a moment about the gray whales. Now you can see in this picture, this is, whale has a very low profile. Um, this is, you know, if you were just looking out of the corner of your eye, you might mistake this for a log floating in the water. There's not a lot here to distinguish. You can see in the picture off to the right, the mist of um, the breath from that whale that just came up to, to the surface to breathe. Gray whales are bottom feeding baleen whales. They're the only bottom feeders that we know of in the baleen, among baleen whales. And they will sometimes come in very close to shore to do that. Um, as the high tide is approaching a high water mark, that is when the gray whales will come in to feed uh, close to shore. They don't have a dorsal fin. You can see in this picture how their coloring can blend in with the water. If there is a good breeze going, uh, that breath, that column of breath can get knocked down uh, by the wind so that you don't really see that if you're looking for it. So they are really, really easy to miss if you're not looking for them. Other things to watch for with grays is the heart shape below you see in the top photograph here. Uh, from certain angles, uh, because of the position of the, the openings of their blowhole, they, when they exhale, it looks like a heart. And when they're doing that feeding close into shore, you can see on the bottom photograph, what you're seeing in that picture are tail flukes, the, the, um, the left tail fluke on the, of the whale on the left-hand part of the picture, and then uh, the pectoral fin, left pectoral fin sticking up in the air on the right-hand part of the picture. Because these whales are feeding in such shallow water that sometimes when they roll over to feed to scoop up a mouthful of um, sediment from the bottom that they're going to filter through their baleen, uh, they actually will expose their, their fins to the air that way. And we can actually identify the individuals by looking at the marks on those pectoral fins, just like humans. They have a, a side preference, so they always roll over to the same side whenever they feed. Um, so we can tell it's always going to be the same pectoral fin that each individual whale will show when it rolls over. Also, the tail flukes will have scar patterns and, uh, and other markings that help us to identify the individuals. So the gray whales have a, a, a pretty remarkable migration. They are traveling from the Bering Sea to Baja throughout the year. Bering Sea in the summer to Baja in the winter and back. That's up to 14,000 miles. And what happens is that they are feeding all summer long. They're storing up fat. And when they're done with that, they, um, they rely on that stored fat for the entire trip down to Baja and back. So as you can imagine, on their way home, they're, uh, they're starting to get a little bit hungry by the time they get up to the Pacific Northwest. And some of them come into the Salish Sea looking for food. And one of the things they're looking for are places where there are lots of ghost shrimp. Ghost shrimp are little arthropods that live in uh, sand sandy and muddy sediment. And it happens that here in central Puget Sound, in Saratoga Pass, Port Susan, um, Possession Sound, and particularly the Snohomish River Delta, we have very high concentrations of ghost shrimp. Some of these hungry humpback, or sorry, hungry gray whales have come in, found this spot, and uh, they keep coming back year after year and spend a few months fueling up before they continue on to their northward journey. So at this time, we call these the Sounders gray whales, and again, we know it's the same whales year after year because um, we've identified them using both marks on their tails, marks on their pectoral fins, and some of them have really distinctive marks on their dorsal ridge, uh, what, where the area where their dorsal fin would be if they had one. Um, so the red area here on the map shows you where these sounders whales are found in the winter and spring. They can come in as early as late December. That's pretty early, but we had one come in that early this year, this past year rather. And they can stay into May and June, really depending on what the ocean conditions are. Um, if, they, if they've had a hard time finding food the year before, they might stay longer. And I think last year or the year before, we had a couple that stayed all year. Uh, or all summer. So that was that was kind of an unusual thing too. 
that circle that you see uh, on the map is where we typically see the gray whales congregating the most between Gedney Island and the mouth of the Snohomish River, which is also right next to the Everett Marina. So there is a lot of vessel traffic there. And um, that is a, uh, that's the spot where I saw the boat hit the whale, hit a gray whale. And I also, uh, the, that opening slide, if you didn't notice, had a picture of um, a very close call that I saw a couple years later, same situation. So this is a place where boaters really need to be very careful and alert uh, from uh, late winter to in through spring to be sure that they're not, um, that they're paying attention for the, the possibility of a gray whale being there. Humpback whales. So here is, uh, this picture is a humpback whale named Two Spot. And you can see that he is right snug up close to a boat. We'll talk about him a little bit more in a moment. Humpback whales are the largest baleen whales that we get in the Salish Sea. Uh, they're not a whale that people necessarily expect to see here because it's fairly recent that they have made a comeback. Since the Marine Mammal Protection Act was passed, uh, these populations of both gray whales and humpback whales have really recovered, and now they're starting to use the inland waters in ways that we haven't seen for a couple generations. Um, so that's a pretty cool thing that we have them out there, but we need to be aware that they're out there and that we might encounter them. They can be here at any time of year, although they are more frequent in the frequently seen in the summer. Um, I've seen them in the middle of winter in Central Puget Sound before. So, and I heard that there was one in uh, Hood Canal recently too. So um, they can show up any place. They're, they're one of those whales that you just need to be aware that it's there and expect it any time. There are certain individuals that have been returning for the past several years who seem to prefer the boundary pass area that's between the San Juan Islands and the Gulf Islands on the uh, where the Canadian border is. And also that area of water between Point No Point, Possession Point, Edmonds and Kingston, that seems to be a spot where some of them like to hang out as well. So that may be a place that they're more likely to be seen, but again, expect them to be any place. Because they surface unpredictably, uh, that makes them vulnerable to boat strikes. And some of our regular humpback whales do have a reputation for mugging boats. And this is what's happening in this picture. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the boat I was on spotted a humpback whale blowing uh, about 200 yards away. We slowed down and boom, next thing we knew, he was right there next to us and he stayed there for about half an hour while we stayed in neutral, just floated there, let him do his thing, and then took off. If this is something that happens to you, if you're out in your boat and suddenly there's a humpback mugging you, the whale is not going to hurt you. Um, he's just curious. Uh, Put your engine in neutral and do not start your do not try to drive away while the whale is close to you um, that can especially if you have a, um, a propeller that can really harm the whale. So just let it do its thing it will eventually decide that it, something else is more interesting and, and uh, leave you alone and then you can go about your day. But uh, that's what happens, you know, if, if you get mugged by a whale that's how you behave. Um, it's not a behavior to encourage certainly because we have lost two humpbacks to, um, to boat strikes here in central Puget Sound uh, in Elliott Bay and uh, in Possession Sound from ferry boats, unfortunately. And those are just the ones that we know about. There may have been additional strikes as well. So be aware that this is a behavior that you might see with humpback whales. Humpback whales are sometimes easier to spot because they tend to be a little bit more acrobatic than gray whales do. It's not uncommon to see them cartwheel where they'll lift their uh, tails out of the water or they'll, they'll slap their tails, they'll slap their, their pectoral flip, uh, flippers and their pectoral flippers are very, very long. Um, they will also sometimes make a trumpeting sound out of their blowhole that you might hear. Um, and that is not necessarily a sound of distress, but it is just, it's an interesting thing to note that sometimes if, uh, if you're close to one, they will do that. And our last whale of the day is the minke whale. This one is not as well known, um, but we do have, again, a population of minkies that return year after year. Uh, we think that they're breeding somewhere in tropical waters, and then they come back just about the time their calves are weaned. And they particularly like the area in the eastern strait of Juan de Fuca. Um, so this red area shows common sighting zones in the summer months. There's another spot that they might 
if you're up in this in the San Juans, this area off Waldron Isle, excuse me, Waldron Island called Cowlitz Bay is another spot where we frequently will see minkies. Um, the minkies are active surface feeders. They are looking for those bait balls, um, herring and, and uh, smelt and things like that. If you see a, a cluster of birds on the water, that indicates that there's probably a school of forage fish underneath the birds, and it may have been chased up to the surface by a predator, and that predator might have been a minke whale. This is particularly common on Partridge Bank, uh, MacArthur Bank, Salmon Bank, and Hind Bank in that area on the, the red part of the map. These are shallower areas uh, in the Eastern Strait where there's a lot of uh, forage fish activity, a lot of bird activity, and sometimes you'll get multiple minkies that are feeding in these areas. These animals are very fast and they change direction very uh, frequently, so they're very unpredictable. You might have one come up right in front of your boat and the next thing you know it's a half mile away or vice versa. Um, they're definitely a whale that with no warning, no, uh, you know, no sign of a blow, no sign of flukes, nothing like that, suddenly there's one in front of you. So this is just one to keep in mind um, that uh, can be, can be in, the, in the area, especially if you're traveling over those shallower banks in the Eastern Strait. All right, there's two spot again, that's his tail and you can see he's got uh, two spots on each lobe of his flukes, that's what gave him his name. That's an example of how we identify those animals in the field and the kind of photograph that would be helpful to uh, help a researcher know which whale you were looking at. Uh, just a few quick take homes before I wrap up here. So just be aware as a boater that whales are out there more so than they've been uh, maybe in the in the time that um, you've been on the water. Now there are more of them out there. They're they're coming in more frequently and they're using the inland waters in ways that they haven't for for several decades. Some whales are slow and low to the surface of the water, which makes them harder to spot. All whale species can appear anywhere at any time. They're wild animals and they do what they like. So keep good watch and report what you see uh, and enjoy. And Elisa, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you to give us our Sounders update. All right, Susan's going to screen share that for me. All right, these are the Sounders that we know that have arrived to date. Our resolution's a little bit fuzzy, but uh, so of the elder sounders, uh, we have 21 Shackleton, who was the first whale ever documented by Cascadia Research, uh, 44 Dubnock, 53 Little Patch, 56, 383. Uh, I have 53 there twice, but it's supposed to be not there, 531 uh, and 723 Lucifer. Uh, and then uh, the first year of the unusual mortality event, it was designated in 2019, but things started happening in 2018. And we had three newbies who came in. Uh, 185 turned out to be a known whale and he's from the Pacific Coast Feeding Group. A uh, little different population that hangs out out on the coast. Uh, and he has returned each year since 2018. So he is now uh, on the catalog, uh, our ID catalog that Cascadia puts out. And we've put out a version in a collaboration with them. Uh, and then three more of the 2019s. There was a huge influx in 2019. And three of those whales have actually returned this year. Uh, 2249, 2255, 2256. And then also a couple from last year, 2259 and 2261. And 2261's a little bit interesting because that whale spent many months up off of Oak Harbor, like daily. And I think was the one at whale that stayed into late fall, mid to late fall. So it was interesting to see that whale, uh, March 31st, uh, Island Adventures and Puget Sound Express reported that whale in traveling with 2259 in Port Susan. So that was fun. And then interest, so uh, each year we get at least a couple of stray whales that 
find their way in here and maybe find their way back out or oftentimes they might be too uh, uh, emaciated and end up dying in Puget Sound. That's not unusual. Uh, but during the UME, we've had higher numbers of stray whales coming in that do not find the feeding areas in the north. All those others that I that we call newbies, they actually did turn up north into the Whidbey Basin area and found the food, and um, but others have not. And so there's quite a few moving about. There's uh, in different areas throughout Puget Sound right now, and out in the Strait of Juan de Fuca, Rosario Strait, and other bays. Um, so we're keeping track of those and we send all reports to Cascadia Research and NOAA. And then one of the whales that showed up in Rosario Strait was first sighted on the 25th, I believe, uh, but we got reports on the 26th was a whale that 1364, Ali Perez, the ID queen at Cascadia Research Collective, um, found the whale and it had only ever been documented once on the outer coast uh, in 2011. So kind of underlines the importance of um, people's sightings and photographs, like good photographs so they can find matches. So that was really cool. Um, one other thing wanted to say and um, just make note of here is um, Cascadia Research gets out and does field survey work quite a bit. And there's also a, a drone team that has joined up within the last couple of years. And so we just wanted to say that if you see the research boats out there and you are a recreational drone flyer, um, two things about that. The regulations are clear to some people and are not clear on the book. So we, ask the people and encourage people to follow all Be Whale Wise guidelines because it is another object and DFW and NOAA do consider that the Southern residents are off limits. And also um, that it is a, considered a vessel. So all Be Whale Wise regulations and guidelines should be followed. But in particular, when the researchers are out there doing their work, if uh, other people are flying their recreational drones, uh, they have to bring theirs down. And so we've been able to get some alerts out when we know they're out there, which has been really helpful. And we've appreciated everybody's cooperation with that. So I think that was the other thing I wanted to say. And uh, Margaret and we have put, just wanted to make note, we've put some links in chat. So before we get to Q and A with Stephanie, uh, we've put some links in chat for uh, different resources to learn more about the gray whales and also about boater uh, resources around boater and watercraft safety and whale safety. So thanks. And then Susan, got one more last slide and then we'll find some questions here. Does anybody have, I don't see any questions in the Q and A. Um, and while we're gathering questions, I, I'm not sure if I'm not able to see our share the water postcards in the chat, but maybe some of you are, but I just thought during the Q&A, I may show those um, or while we start the Q&A. Um, and that um, we will also, if it hasn't been posted, we will post the link to our our share the water YouTube playlist. So if you didn't see our first two webinars, you can watch them. Um, and also this one will be added to that if you know of others who want to see it. Hopefully by tomorrow, we should get that uploaded. Let's see. That's awesome, Francis. They've identified 43 minkies in the Salish Sea and see the same individuals return year after year. Some have been returning for 40 years. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> um, Marilyn, who were the two grays that spent much time off West Beach's deception pass last year or a year before? 
I think, uh, I, yeah, several of them did two, two, five, three for sure. Maybe two, two, five, two. And they both stayed really late into the end of summer. And I think that was, yeah, 2019. Uh, volunteer opportunities with Cascadia, uh, click on their website, their link in the chat and you'll need to be in touch with them about that. All right, anybody have any questions for Stephanie? Um, maybe not. Give people a chance to Well, Richard, while other people are thinking about any questions they may have, uh, Richard Snowberger is asking about the latest ID guide for the Sounders. Uh, I know Cindy may have more information on that. Um, yes, we do need to do an update on that guide, uh, just so everybody knows what that is. We did do, Elisa had mentioned a little bit earlier, we did a gray whale ID guide in partnership with Cascadia Research uh, a few years ago. And we did do a few updates on it last year, but didn't end up printing it because there were, you know, our whale center was closed and people weren't on the water as much with COVID. So um, we are working on some updates again, but things are changing so quickly with the gray whales right now with all of these newbies coming in, as Elisa said. So we're definitely going to get those updates going and uh, get that out next year. That's the plan. Okay, that one's done. Some appreciations. Uh, any? We're happy to take more questions if anyone has any and wants to put them in the Q and A. It's not. I saw the mention of the um, the the birds for the gray whales. Yeah, I've noticed that surf scoters in particular, flocks of surf scoters, will often follow the grays close to shore uh, to kind of take advantage of whatever they're stirring up. Definitely. Um, it, I also wanted to just mention there's a lot of great things that we put in the chat and that you can save your chat um, by going down to the little three dots um, in the bottom corner there and click on save chat so that you will have those links to look at later. And then I will share my Share the thank you slide again. Okay, okay here we go. Uh, Stephanie, this is pretty basic, but please explain what a sounder is. Yeah, the sounders are the what we call the particular group of whales that keep returning to that uh, Saratoga Pass, Port Susan, Possession Point or Possession Sound area year after year. So when we talk about a sounder, I mean, I. I don't know if, if there's a, a clear research definition, but I would imagine a whale that has come back a second year then becomes a member of the sounders. Um, so the ones that keep coming back year after year, same whales to the same place, those are the sounders as opposed to gray whales that come in and um, as Elisa mentioned, some of them don't find that place where they can feed. So they may find their way back out of the Salish Sea or they may uh, be so emaciated that they starve to death inside um, the inland waters. Those aren't the sounders. They don't become sounders unless they find that little secret fishing hole and then keep coming back. All right. Anonymous just wanted to say thank you so much as a resident of Kameno. I have been so privileged to see some of the grays. I only wish I could get better photos to share. We appreciate anything you all share. Sometimes even a cell phone video does confirm species ID. So please don't feel shy about sending us those. They may not be able to get us an individual ID, but certainly uh, 
has helped in many occasion. Stephanie, did you have anything else you wanted to add? No, I don't think so. Thank you so much for the opportunity, um, both uh, for me and for Robert to come and, and share this information with you. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Yes, and thanks so much for reaching out, both of you and Margaret, and um, for collaborating on this important project of spreading the word to all watercraft users. And we encourage everyone to learn as much as you can. Uh, here we go, another question from Dawn. Have you noticed any change in the whale's habit with the reduced vessel traffic due to COVID? <laughs> Hmm. I'm not aware. I, I'm not aware of any specific work that's been done around that. It seems to me I, I've heard something about it, but it's not something I've been personally involved in. Yeah, this has come up before and we did cover this in, I think, I don't know if it was our first or second webinar. Um, so there was a time when the waters were quieter in the beginning of COVID, but actually Last uh, spring, boat sales in Washington went up by 33% in the months of May and June, I believe, or June and July. So, uh, and then people were eager to get out on the water. So there were actually, when its temperature started uh, warming up, there were probably, there were more boats on the water. And just in, uh, moderating uh, sightings threads and things like that, we did notice an uptick in, in, in boats on the water. So, but we had heard people were wanting to, I think even the Port of Seattle was hoping to have been able to take advantage of that time to do studies, but I don't think anyone had the budget to do it. Cindy, do you remember anything else or about that? Or know anything? No, I think you got it. Okay. Thank you. Well, if nobody has any more questions, I think that we've all spent our time well here. And we appreciate everything everyone does here. And ah, they keep coming in, let's see. Francis said they did some with Oceans Initiative. So mm -hmm. hopefully we'll get to see the results of that someday. I'm guessing Francis. <laughs> All, right. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. And thank you, Seattle Maritime Academy and Margaret and Robert and Stephanie for all sharing your information and Elisa for all you do with keeping track of all those whales out there and for Cindy, all you do for educating and being our, our Zoom queen um, <laughs> and keeping us all, all on screen when we need to be. <laughs> And you too, Susan, for creating yeah. Orchid Network <laughs> and all the work you do. No, we're just just happy to, to be here and have the whales that keep coming around. And we actually got to see a gray whale from our house on Sunday. So I was really excited because we're usually watching other people's pictures of whales that we're too busy to get out to watch. So it was great to see a spout. So we, we appreciate all you out who get out there more often on the water or on the shore and share all your reports. It's, it's very fun and it's very helpful because it's, um, it assists many researchers who are researching all kinds of whales. So safe, safe travels out there, whether you're on the shore or on the water, and we appreciate you wanting to come and learn and be a part of this tonight. Thank you. And watch our watch our page for the, the next one. <laughs> Good night. Thanks, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Night.